It always rains at Le Mans. June 3rd, 2008. It is just past 8 a.m., 11 days before the most famous auto race in the world. The pit lane is empty. Almost. The Audi racing team is here. The team that has won the 24 hours of Le Mans, seven of the past eight years. They trickle in slowly. Mechanics, engineers, and drivers. There is work to do. We're gonna do five pit stops. The sixth one will be fuel only in the garage. Go! <laughs> every scenario they can think of. Okay, crew, this next stop, we fuel outside, the car goes in the garage, we change the tires, the driver, and right-hand injector loop. Newman raced here and finished second. Steve McQueen made a movie about it. But the 24 hours of Le Mans is not easy to capture because it's like nothing else. Everything is different here. There's something that you wouldn't be able to catch in your camera, I think. Le Mans 24 hours is one of the legends. It's one of the three big races in the world of motorsport. You've got the Indy 500, which is very well known in North America, obviously, and around the world. You've got Monaco Formula One Grand Prix, and you've got the Le Mans 24 Hours. It began with a simple question. Who can drive the farthest in 24 hours? For nearly a century, it has been motorsport's ultimate challenge pushing man and machine to their absolute limits. Its distance is as long as a trip from New York to Los Angeles. It is driven at all hours, in all weather, on an eight and a half mile circuit of mostly public roads. Since 1923, the greatest drivers and car makers in the world have answered its call. They made 
created their names in a race designed to test and push new technology. Windshields and wipers, headlights and hoods, seat belts and disc brakes, they all owe a debt to Le Mans. Racing is different here, in part because the cars are different. The cars don't all look the same. They don't have the same engine. They don't have the same, I suppose, attitude to the question of, let's make a car go faster for 24 hours. There's plenty of room for people to express themselves in the designs of cars. Even the sound of the cars is different. When you hear a Corvette rumble by, you don't even have to look over the top of here, you know that's a Corvette. When you hear a Ferrari screaming past, same thing, you know that that's a Ferrari. Audi arrived in 1999 and debuted its R8 a year later. The R8 went on to win Le Mans five times in six years. But their greatest innovation came in 2005 with the diesel-powered R10 TDI. No diesel had ever won Le Mans. Ulrich Baretsky was the man charged with building the new engine for Audi. This is uh, the three years of my life. Beretsky is, uh, is crazy. I think he lives somewhere in the world of the engines. That's like in the good old days. You see, there's a camshaft. There are two cams underneath. These are the injection lines. This is the collector, the air collector. There's the air is coming from the turbocharger sitting here, uh, from the intercooler sitting here. The air is entering here through this air restrictor, which limits the power is going through. This turbocharger is driven by the exhaust gases with the energy is coming out here. It's all very simple at the end of the day. The R10 was a fuel-efficient 650-horsepower beast that barely made a peep. It made me discover some of the noises that you never hear because they are covered by the engine. So the transmission noise. You can hear the tires. You can hear the drivetrain more you get to about 120 miles an hour and the wind noise over your helmet is more than the engine noise behind you. Noise is a form of energy and the less you hear means the more you use in propulsion. It's sexy, this sound. Sex has nothing to do with screaming. Some people believe that, but others make it more quiet but more sensitive and that's how we wanted to make this diesel. The R10 was launched with a top speed of 220 miles an hour. It raced a Harrier jet in England and more than held its own. But it was at Le Mans where it really flew. In 2006, the diesel not only won the 24 hours, it dominated. The R10 captured the race in the original spirit of Le Mans. In those days, of course, it was about proving the technology of the cars. And nowadays, oh yeah, it's about proving the technology of the cars. Audi won again in 2007. Two in a row for the R10. But this team's greatest challenge was still ahead. Two thousand and eight is the R ten's third season in racing. That's a lifetime. By its third year, a car has little room left for improvement, and there is always a new challenger. The French automaking giant Peugeot has produced a diesel of its own. This season, it has been quicker than the Audi. In the shorter races leading up to Le Mans, Peugeot has qualified with faster lap times. The gap has been significant. 1.6 seconds. That's quite a lot.
So if it's already here, one and a half and then more. Three. This year, from the beginning, we have not been the dominant car. Are you guys afraid of the Peugeots? Not afraid of, but we know they are strong, you know? Which is normal because our car is quite some years old now and they have a brand new one, so... Yes. But I, I don't think they're going to be able to hold up for 24 hours, though, do you? That's what we hope. Sebring, Florida is a long way from France. But the 12 hours of Sebring is the most important race in the run-up to Le Mans. Audi had won here eight straight years. But in practice, the R10 struggled. A bad omen for the head of Audi Motorsport, Dr. Wolfgang Rorick. We destroyed without having one race. In the last 10 days, 700,000 euros. My control is amazed. He asked me to change all the drivers. <laughs> Fascinating storylines here in the 56, 12 hours of Sebring. Big fight is on the front row and Sebring is underway. Peugeot took the lead on the opening lap. For the two Audis in the race, things only got worse from there. Audi's lost time in the pits. One had a faulty turbocharger. The other had to replace its brake discs halfway through the race. And it was purely because we were going to run out of front brakes. And in my Audi history, we've never done that. By dusk, Audi's eight-year winning streak in Florida was over. Both R10s completed the race. One finished third. But this is not a team that aspires to finish third. Winning Sebring in 2000, 2001, 2003, and so on and so on, do you think it has to go to the eternity? No. Every victory, you have to fight for it, you know? Yeah, there's a word in Germany you say, a defeat is good for the character if you take it the right way. Some driver errors, some working errors with some penalties in the pit, so we collected all the sh you can find. I think we're going to have a very big debrief at Audi, aren't we? You can be sure on that, and we know we have a lot to do until the month. to explain to you how important Le Mans this year for us is, because it will be the most difficult one. This is why I needed to have the best teams, which I have. To complete the 24 hours of Le Mans, a team needs three drivers per car. No driver is allowed to stay behind the wheel longer than four hours at a time. It's not so easy with race drivers because they have to be a little bit selfish if they really want to be fast, but also they have to be a team player that is ready to share a car with two other guys. You know, we always say you never share two things, a woman or a car, so, and you share one of them. At Le Mans, Audi will field three cars using nine drivers. It's a lineup of all-stars. The elder statesmen are Emanuele Piro and Frank Bieler, along with their teammate, Marco Werner. They are the two-time defending champions. But no driver has won the race more than Mr. Le Mans, Tom Christensen. 
The Danes' record of seven victories stands alone in the nearly century-long history of the race. When you can win once is already something special. When you can win seven times is something difficult to explain. Because no one's going to do it again. No one is going to do it again. Jackie X took three times as long in terms of years and appearances to do six. And he is Mr. Le Mans, or at least was. Seven wins out of nine appearances is quite remarkable. The streets of Le Mans read like his personal walk of fame. This little French square, they have put in these cool tires in Bronx with the winning drivers of, um, of different years. To say which one or to pick which one, that's not really fair. You can't really choose between your children. It's something like that. 2001, there was 19 hours of rain. Uh, that feels uh, the longest one. It feels like you were in the racing car for a week. 2005, for me personally, this is something incredible. This was my seventh victory, and obviously it means a lot to me. Christensen has not won here since breaking the record in 2005. For the past two years, he has raced with Dindo Capello and Alan McNeish. Le Mans has not been kind to McNeish. The Scotsman has only won here once, in 1998 with Porsche. It is perhaps a sign of his fortunes here, but his name is misspelled on the only plaque that bears his name in the center of town. If you look at his results in Le Mans, it does not really fit together with what I thought that could have been done, but there has always been something unpredictable happening. I personally do not believe in luck. I think luck is an excuse for people that have failed in their mission to do something. If you do your preparation correct, if you do the work, if you think about things, if you make the correct judgments on the risks that you take, and if you stay out of the pits, then you win the race. And that's not luck, that's hard work. If luck exists, it wasn't with McNish and Capello this spring. They have not won a single race in the run-up to Le Mans. Another battle with Peugeot in Monza, Italy. They were lucky to lose only a race. First of all, I didn't realize at the first moment how big was the accident. Even when the car was flying, in my mind, my picture was the car is running and I'm able to bring the car back to the pit. I was very, very lucky. So we came to the pits and uh, yeah, we had basically to build a new car. There is more to a race team than its drivers. And that was obvious in Monza. When you look from the outside, it looks absolutely chaotic. The car goes into the garage and then all of a sudden it's a, a red cloud of guys hanging over it. After a certain amount of time, that cloud disappears again and out comes a, a proper race car. And when you stand there and watch it, you realize why they have won so many races. I think it's quite clear in motorsport that things do go wrong. And you can practice some aspects of it, but you cannot practice an accident like that. And if you repair in 20 minutes, and your opponent is repairing in an hour, that does give you a big advantage. In this case, the car was rebuilt in 15 minutes. Later in the race, Alan McNish narrowly missed real trouble. I 
I had just overtaken him and was coming down into the first chicane, which is right and then immediately left. Just as I started to turn left, I could see out of the corner of my eye there was a lot of dust flying up in the air. I don't think I've seen such a violent accident in 25 years of racing. And I had to thread my way through the debris. Up until then, I had just assumed he had this accident sort of evolving in front of me. But when I looked at it the next day, I realized that there was a big dark shadow of a car that flew literally just over the top behind the car and was within a few inches of taking, you know, our car out as well. Gave me a bit of a, a chill down the spine and a reminder that motor racing is still dangerous. Remarkably, the other driver only suffered a few broken toes. For McNish, Emerging unharmed was the only bit of good fortune in a tough spring. But for another Audi team, Monza was a coming out party. I, I followed the Peugeot and they don't use the curb a lot in the second chicane, or it was at least the car was in front of me. Because the second chicane, they are too high. The curves. If you really hit them, our Look, car... You have to... Alexander Premo and Mike Rockefeller are Audi's two youngest drivers. In Italy, they were also the best hope for victory against Peugeot. flag from McNish's near miss went up late in the afternoon. Rocky was leading the 1,000 kilometers of Monza. Peugeot number eight made its move but could not survive the tight first corner. The car went out of bounds. It would have to return to the pit for a penalty. But there was a miscommunication in the Audi pit. Rocky had the race won, but he continued to battle. So he kept on fighting, and uh, yeah, he tried to overtake Rocky again. Rocky defended the inside line. The two cars made contact. Only Rocky's was damaged. The puncture to the left front tire. Just minutes left in the race, Peugeot had beaten Audi again. The error was that nobody told him clearly, Rocky, don't race him, just let him go, go as fast as possible to the end, and we are going to wake it. Sometimes two words more could help, sometimes two words more are too much. Racing, you can think about it and try to make it better, it will happen anyway, somehow, again. It's a long walk to the podium when the destination is not the top step. Circuit de la Sarthe. This is the track the R10 was built for. 
and the track the drivers live for. It is 8.46 miles of seduction, with a little bit of everything. High-speed sweepers, tight curves or chicanes, and long straights to reward the fastest cars, if the drivers are brave enough to keep their foot on it. That's where we dive into the first chicane. That's the tightest of the two. It really takes a lot of energy having to break down from top speed. The old days, they just kept going. And now we go to the most beautiful part of the track. You accelerate out of a notch. Nice grass, nice trees. You romanticize a little bit about the circuit in this area. Just look, isn't it beautiful? The way they call we come. And the energy, what you take through there, it's... It's uh, quite amazing. That's the thing when you're at Le Mans. When the car goes by you in the pit and the time pops, the next time you see it, it's been almost nine miles, right? It's been nine miles across the French countryside in three minutes, 35. And I mean, I love that. The race begins at 3 p.m. Saturday and ends at 3 p.m. Sunday. And everyone has a favorite moment. The first time I came here, in 1997, I didn't really know. I knew Le Mans, but I didn't appreciate Le Mans. And I stood at the end of the pit lane, and I at seven o'clock for the start of qualifying, 45 cars driving out of the pit lane, all that, you know, power just driving off onto that historic circuit with the old grandstanders in the background, and just that whole history and emotion and the thoughts and memories of the Steve McQueen film came flooding back into me. And now, if I'm not driving at that moment, I will always go to the end of the pit lane and stand and watch it. And I get the same chill down my spine as I did that first time. You've got upwards of 30,000 horsepower coming across the line. And I, look, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It's also a very special moment when I go normally up in the grandstands on the seventh floor and have a look around and see the sun coming up. It's a very quiet moment, no spectators around. You have just the cars running, the roaring of the engines or not roaring if the diesel is coming. It's a fantastic view. But really the end of the race. This is 24 hours and when the guys come across the line, it doesn't matter whether you're first or last. This is the place where champagne was first sprayed in celebration. Tradition well worth the 24-hour wait. It's an endurance for everyone, and come 3 o'clock on Sunday, there's going to be an outpouring of emotion, not just by the competitors, but by the spectators and everyone around the race who... It's that, that shared experience thing. Everyone's tired, everyone gets a little emotional, but God, we've got through it. I think there's one thing I would definitely rather do, and only one thing I would definitely rather do, than three o'clock on Saturday afternoon be starting the race out here, Le Mans 24 hours in 2008 with our group. And that's at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon, crossing the line in first position, and then standing on the podium at 3.05, celebrating, spraying some champagne, and realizing that we've achieved something that is just immense in the worldwide scheme of things. It is two weeks before the race. All three teams are here. Car three will be driven by the youngsters, Lucas Lure, Alexander Prema, and Mike Rockenfeller. I think we all can do the job. Last year, Lucas did qualifying and the start. I did the finish, <laughs> <laughs> but not a good one. In their first 24-hour race with Audi in 2007, the youngsters learned the first lesson of Le Mans. One mistake, and it can all be over. 
devastation for the Audi team. Young Mike Rockefeller has crashed the R10 heavily at Tete Rouge. And look at the Audi team. They are in disbelief. This is the team they were calling the youngsters with so much talent. And the day has finished before it's really begun. It was the worst race in my career, for sure. The worst moment. It was hard for me to look them in the eyes after because, yeah, I ruined my race, I ruined their race, and all the mechanics as well. They said, hey, come on, next year we come back and we win. But you're just so disappointed. It doesn't mean anything to me what they said, really, because I was just thinking I'm such an idiot. I think what happened last year is incredibly hard on any young driver. Any young driver wants to impress more than anything. In many teams, what happened to Rocky last year would have been the last thing he did with the team. That's why it's something special to me to come this year again. I think we all want to show that if you are young, you can do good in Le Mans. And also, of course, we want to beat the old guys. The old guys who won it the last two years are back. And Manuel Piro and Frank Bieler will again team with Marco Vanna in car one. Likely for the last time. Of course, there is so much experience in this group of drivers. It would be a perfect moment to end your career. On the other hand, you could say, it's working so well, why should we stop? Unfortunately, the, the nicest victory is always the next one. Yeah, you're right. Now I'm 46, so I don't know what is going to happen with me next year. I've done a lot in motor racing, but from the other hand, I'm not quite ready to stop, so we we'll see. In car two, Dindo Capello and Alan McNish will join Mr. Le Mans, Tom Christensen, just as soon as they can find him. Tom, don't know where he is. Huh. I've looked it out. Have you seen Tom? Huh? I haven't seen Tom at all. I have no idea. Ah, uh, where's Tom? If anybody's seen Tom Christensen, can they send him over here? Yeah. You, you were just there? Yeah, but you went there, you had been there, you saw I was there. I thought you had a Manueli. Looks similar. <laughs> now that's an insult, isn't it? You could say each car crew were, you know, we're a small family, you know, and and you could even say, you know, the drivers, it's almost like a marriage for them. This is test day. It is the first time every car from every team can get on the circuit and experiment with setups for the race. So we're just going to lower the car. You're obviously going to have more overall downforce, so let me know about touching, and then we'll go to the next configuration. Car setup is crucial. A balance between speed, handling, and fuel efficiency. But for a single lap, there is no matching the speed of Peugeot. As feared, now three seconds a lap faster on the eight and a half mile circuit. From all the races leading up to that, we knew where our performance stood against Peugeot. Compared to Peugeot in acceleration, initial acceleration, we lose a lot. Copy that. Get used to it. But at the test day, uh, when it rained, this kind of, you know, showed up alarm bells to us. You know, for the wet condition, maybe they had to do something different to, to bring a balance to the car. Huge accident here at Test Day. He's fine, but they've got to now build a brand new car. Yeah, the wall it's broken. <laughs> I think it's a bigger hit. 
The lessons from Test Day are clear. Persia is very fast, yet vulnerable. Audi must exploit every advantage they can find. That is why less than 48 hours after Test Day, 11 days before the race, the team is back at the track, working on a day when no one else is. You ready? Go! It's not rocket science. You can spend millions of pounds developing a car to get a tenth, but you can lose five, ten, you know, more seconds at every pit stop. So, you know, it's simple maths, isn't it? We consider it free time. I'm afraid that was a bit slow. It was 10.8. So we're going to need some more practice. rain, cold, heat. In the changing conditions at Le Mans, choosing the right tire can be the difference between victory and defeat. This tire here is a slick tire. It's used for dry running. The middle tire here is what we call an intermediate. It's used when the track is damp, but not really wet. This is a tire that's designed for running in heavy rain, but it will not last very long once the track dries out. The public roads that make up over half the track are closed. Race week has begun. For the teams, the week kicks off with scrutineering, where the cars must pass inspection. Scrutineering is like a boxing weigh-in. Before the cars tip the scales, before the brake lights are tested, an entrance is made. This year's race features a battle of heavyweights. Champions versus the talented upstart. Our car is seriously fast. It has a lot of downforce, of course, a lot of torque and power from the engine. So the pressure is on because we have the fastest machine. When you go to the toughest race of them all, there's pressure on everyone. But I would say I see this race here as a, as a race we can win, and somebody else maybe down the pit lane a race they can lose. Probably a Peugeot will win the race. I just hope that uh, if a Peugeot wins, it, it's ours. The three Peugeots qualified first, second, and third. Audi, fourth, fifth, and seventh. Peugeot have got a set of nine drivers. Eight of them have got Formula One experience. Unfortunately, they are not all experienced at endurance racing. Patience is a key to winning at Le Mans. The place where it's a bit difficult to overtake sometimes is braking for the first chicane. You break, you overtake them on the outside. No, that I don't do. That I never try. Because it's dirty, you're on the outside, I never try. And I want to try. <laughs> Jacques Villeneuve will be driving in the number seven Peugeot. At Le Mans, he has the rare chance to complete racing's triple crown. He has already won the Formula One championship and Indy 500. No, but outside of Porsche, it's easy on this year to overtake. Believe me, we're going to win the race, but we take less risks. Smile, than this, please. Yeah. Sure. Please smile. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Villeneuve and his teammates know the circuit de la Salle, but not like the Audi drivers, who know it off the top of their heads. You know, this is, this is our backyard. 
it's ingrained into me. Now here you are, here in the pit lane. This is for the driver's eye view. It's incredibly low and close to the ground. You see, now you release the speed lane limiter. You're accelerating out of the pit lane, up into second, third, fourth, fifth gear, using the curb on the right-hand side on a racing line, down into second gear for the Dunlop S. Now this is a very tricky corner because as you can see, it's uphill and also the camber of the road falls away from you. Third gear, underneath the bridge, and then down into the actual S's themselves. Fourth and then fifth gear. Breaking hard here, the car always wants to keep turning right, but you need to make it turn left. You need to get in there, the car understeers, you break fourth gear, and then accelerating towards Tete Rouge. Very, very critical corner. Very, very fast entry now. And you've got to make sure that the 140 mile an hour, 145 mile an hour exit is critical for your straight line speed at the end of the straight. Now you're on the first part of the mole sign. Now you've taken top gear. Now you can relax. Now you can look at the steering wheel. Make sure all of the data is correct. Make sure there's no alarms. Speak to your engineer if you have to. Get some response before stealing yourself, before coming up to the breaking point for this uh, first chicane. Breaking hard just after the 200 meter board, down into third gear. Now you've been doing 220 miles per hour. You come into this corner and you're actually only doing about 100 in the mid corner. You accelerate hard, again trying to get the maximum exit. The car, let the car run free, fourth and then fifth gear, coming down towards the second chicane. Another point just to be very careful. Crossing the crown of the road, you have to do it at a certain point, otherwise the car grounds out. If you do that for 24 hours, you'll damage the bottom of it. Here the braking point is tricky in the night because it's just in between two zones. Down into third, the car always understeers here. You never get the front end, you never feel comfortable, but you have to do it precisely and correctly every time. Now we're coming up to the hump. Now this used to be a big jump over where the car would go like, now it's a little bit easier on you into the Mole Satin corner. Very difficult corner because suddenly you lose all feeling of efficiency. You're coming from 200 miles an hour down into about 55, 60 miles per hour and you don't have the sensation of the grip underneath you. Before you accelerate out third, fourth, fifth gear, going through the small kinks down towards Indianapolis. One of my favorite sections on the whole circuit. That is what you see at night. That sun coming into your eyes, going from the contrast of not being able to see into the darkness of the, of the, the trees. Down into third gear for this left-hander. Now you've came through the previous one, 170 miles per hour. You're trying to stop the car into the left, and then suddenly you come to Arnage, one of the hardest corners on this track, because it is so slow, because your brain is going so fast all the other points, and then suddenly you've got to go at 50 miles per hour. Suddenly you've got to be delicate and get a clean exit before accelerating down towards the Porsche curves. Now these are real men's corners. They're very, very fast, in at 200 miles per hour, down the gear, quickly in towards the apex on the right-hand side, flat out on fourth gear, up into fifth. Now we're doing about 180 miles per hour, the road looks very narrow, the armco barrier is very close, keeping in towards that right hand white line, don't touch the grass, you'll be off. Into fifth gear, through the chicane, now you've only got two corners to go, the Ford chicane, and this is a very difficult one, you can gain everything or you can lose everything just by breaking too late here. Down to third gear, run the curve on the left, run the curve on the right, try to keep over to the right to get a good clean exit out of the last one, hit the curve on the left, hit the curve on the right wide open throttle on third gear, four, fifth, over the line. That's three minutes 23 and over eight and a half miles done. Tomorrow, the grandstands and campsites will be filled with more than 250,000 spectators. 40,000 are from Denmark, here to cheer their favorite son. The cult of being around the Le Mans is, is quite big in Denmark at the moment. They enjoy the nationalism of having a Dane running in the race. Så mange danskere, det er helt fantastisk, og det er, det er varme og virkelig, og det er vi jo. Peugeot har kørt en fremragende pole position, og stort tillykke til dem. De har bygget en bil, deres nye bil er, er helt fenomenal. Det er ikke det franske lort. Den, øh, den oversætter vi ikke lige til amerikansk tv. Øh. In this camp, I brought my charming Italian driver. Dindo Capelli. I'd say he's for sure the fastest Italian in our car. Uh, this year, Gelayo is very fast, you know, and, uh, but uh, sometimes 
you know, when you look at the circus, you see the lion jumping into the ring. Uh, jumping through one ring is easy, through two rings is not so difficult, but jumping through four rings probably gets a little bit more difficult. <laughs> After a year of preparation, the day is finally here. The 24 hours of Le Mans. 165 drivers from 24 different countries. A chance to compete in the most grueling motorsport event in the world. Even before the race has begun, we've actually been awake for 10 hours already. The 24 hours themselves are then the most intense work that we do all year. Everybody who is involved, the mechanic, tire people, everybody has to give 100%. Because if, if one little thing doesn't work, the whole system breaks down and, 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 and you cannot win a race. In a race they've dominated for the better part of a decade, Audi is no longer the favorite. Alan McNish told me the 24 hour race of Le Mans this year is Peugeot's to lose, not ours to win. Now, do I think he believes that? Not at all. But I think we've got a real battle this year, and it's too close to call, to be quite honest. Alan, waiting you to check. Yeah, ready at 154. Just under three minutes to engine start. It doesn't count who has the pole or who does the quickest lap. After 24, you know the truth. It's long, and I can tell you every lap you do out there, every lap you have to live in exactly at the point now and be alert. That's the whole na name of the game. I believe in luck, no, certainly not. I believe in, uh, in good preparation and uh, in self-confidence. This is why we're here. behind after three laps which is near as what not is three and a half seconds a lap so the Audis are gonna have to find this three and a half seconds a lap from somewhere. Howden Haynes or H is the lead engineer of the number two car driven by Christensen, Capello and McNish. So crew it will be fuel only 210 on standby. Box Alan Box pit this lap. To keep pace with Peugeot, the strategy is simple. 
Maximize fuel efficiency and take fewer pit stops with fewer driver changes. The plan was we would quadruple stint every driver. Actually, I don't think anybody else did. Peugeot certainly didn't. Alan, are you OK for another two? McNish is staying in the car. This is a quadruple stint for McNish. He's been in the car for two hours. One stint is about 45 minutes. Four stints is nearly the length of the Indy 500. We had reason to believe that our car was more reliable than their car. So from the beginning, the harder we could push them, the harder we make them run, then the closer they could be to having problems with their car. The strategy begins to pay off. The two leading Peugeots must pit due to faulty headlights. The number eight and the number nine have no operating right-hand side light. Peugeot number eight has bigger issues. The car's going to go in the garage, yeah, it is. Bob. That's right. Oh, no. Gary, Gary. The car's going to go in the garage. I don't know why, but round it goes and back it goes. So, drama for Peugeot number eight. Well, this is disastrous for Peugeot. This is not good. For information, Alan, the eighth car has just gone in the garage. There is a problem with the transmission. The race's early leader will spend the next 20 minutes in the garage. McNish has gone through into the lead, Bob. Well, that's something. Le Mans is beginning to claim its victims. But the R10s are running strong. First, fourth, and fifth. Alan McNish, he is consistently two seconds a lap quicker than the other two Audis. And there's no real explanation than that other than the fact that Alan is driving the socks off the car. I saw him doing something through the traffic, and I said, oh, I better don't do it. If something happens, then I'm really in the you know? So uh, I kind of took it a little slower, especially in traffic, overtaking cars. Of course, I lost some time against Alan, but overall, I was happy with the performance and happy that we were still in the race. Hello, my favorite engineers. You have uh, average lap time of Alan. The fastest lap by any Audi driver is actually set by Lula's teammate, Alexander Prema, in the 3.23.9. I feel sorry for Alexander Prema because he didn't actually get to drive this car last year um, because Mike Rockefeller crashed it before it was his turn, as it were. Get ready, Rocky. Okay, it's all good. Everybody get clear. Go, go, go. I think the first lap I come by Tetra Rouge, I, I look close to the guardrail and, you know, it's a strange feeling, let's say. But then I, I don't think about it anymore. Meanwhile, Capello, uh, anything McNish can do, uh, Capello can do too, because that's Capello doing uh, his fourth stint. Three hours in a row in the car, driving at 100%, I tell you that it was not easy. Especially if you think then a uh, few hours later you have to be back in the car and do again the same. The race is playing out as expected for the number two team. Except when once again they manage to lose their most famous driver. Do you know where Tom is? Tom is Christensen. Have you seen him? No. You seen Tom? No. Oh. Tom, if you can hear me, about seven laps, eight laps maximum. Before you're in the car, just let me know that you've got this message. I think he was upstairs having a massage or something, you know, normal racing driver stuff, I guess. But, you know, we're, we're babysitters more than engineers, I think. I just panic when I don't see someone's around. That's correct. That's okay. Mr. Lamont shows up for work on time at dusk. Box, Dindo, box, full service. By the end of Saturday, the lead will have changed hands 11 times. and so people, they need to work as a whole group. 
and not as individuals. And if nothing is disturbing that machine and it's running to the best for the whole operation, then it's a very powerful machine. You see it and you feel it when it's working properly. The number two car is right there, running the perfect race. But they had run the perfect race before. A year ago, the car of Christensen, Capello and McNish was laps ahead of the field in the 16th hour. The number two car looking awfully strong. They are giving that car a great ride. At that time in the race, I think we had a three and a half, maybe nearly four lap lead. In fact, it was going too well. We probably ran the perfect race up until over 16. And that's when Le Mans bit. lost the rear uh, wheel at uh, our top speed going down to uh, Indianapolis. No chance to save the car and the car skidded in very heavily into the barrier. That was it, the quickest car of the whole race event. The car that should definitely have won here normally was out of the race. It was a big disappointment for everybody. You just see the frustration and I just, they're stunned. Nobody knows, but at one stage, I could not stop crying after uh, we lost the wheel. The emotion for me was so strong because we really deserved that victory. It's the same feeling like you were dancing with the most beautiful girl the whole evening. Everything goes according to plan, and even the small tricks you put in on the dance floor, it seems to work. And then at the final dance, you see your brother running away with this beautiful lady. Even if you do 20 races in Le Mans, you can be sure the next one will not be the same as one of the 20s you have done. Every year you have to face challenges that you don't know before, and this is the big secret of Le Mans. forgotten about what's out there you know you kind of you expect it to be there for the whole race and the whole thing it it, it becomes a blur to be honest Tired. the biggest thing is trying to stay away you're looking at the live telemetry which in itself is just completely mesmerizing you know you, you're just looking at the same lines going over for 24 hours you know I think if I go and have a sleep I'll the trailer, anyone will notice. <laughs> Everyone would notice. The engineers are the only line of communication to the drivers. They have to trust everything I say. 
over 200 mile out on the more signs and not on the time or the place to be questioning something, is it? You know, when you think of what we're actually doing, we're in charge of pretty dangerous machinery and you've got to make the right decisions that actually could be life and death. Put the wrong tyres on the car in the wrong conditions and, yeah, you can have a massive accident. Far ahead of the pack, the diesels cut a quiet path through the night. The two cars in second place currently has had no technical issues throughout the race. They cannot match the speed of the Peugeot, but that's not a problem in their mind. They've got a race strategy, and they're sticking to it. The Audi strategy has taken everything into account, including the weather, because it always rains at Le Mans. This is what we've got on the weather. Get it up. You've seen it. We have our own weather system there. We have our own radar. We can predict rain to three minutes. So we knew the rain was coming. The trick is to be within range of the front-running number seven car when the rain arrives. It is the midpoint of the race, and Le Mans is taking a toll on the home team. And the car is going in the garage. We didn't expect this. Well, problem with the number eight. And they're swarming all over it. Shame it's not the other car. Soon, all three of the French cars lose time due to a radiator problem. Even race leader Jacques Villeneuve in car seven. There it goes, and it goes back into the garage. Did note your information when you next get to Monsan Corner and Porsche Curve. There could be some very, very light drizzle. Audi's moment has arrived. We knew it would be a big advantage, and we were ready for it. Simple as that. Two cars in here, driver change taking place. Capello did about three and a half stints there. And, and Tom it, is in. TK is in. By the time Christensen climbs into the car, Villeneuve's lead is down to a minute. The Formula One and Indy 500 champion is no match for Mr. Le Mans. are coming down and you see him going you know, 310, 315, 320. You know, it's pitch black. And you just get, you know, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. At night when you are on the right tires, you get into the rhythm. You really feel like you're one with the car. The very fast corners, you don't see the apex of the corner before you're actually there. So you drive really a lot on your um, determination, you drive a lot on your confidence, and at night, when you are fast, there's nothing better. Villeneuve is on top, but Tom Christensen is chasing him down. The gap now just over 10 seconds, so TK taking sometimes seven, eight seconds a lap out of Villeneuve's lead. Crew, be on standby, be on standby. And I want the inters out, but we stay on the same time. And as Tom rolled down there, the margin between he and Villeneuve was just 2.9 seconds. 
They pit at the same time. Audi adds only fuel. Peugeot also changes tires and drivers. By the time Villeneuve is out of the car, Christensen is long gone. So is Peugeot's lead. TK in the position he relishes, out front. I think it's the best. Simply, it's simply the best for this very moment. At this moment, Ulrich Baretsky is in his favorite place. The top row of the grandstands with dawn about to break. The man behind the engine of the R10 is pleased with what he sees. At the beginning of a hopefully very nice day. The Peugeots are a little bit in trouble now because they went for full speed and full risk and now in the rain it's a little bit very, very dangerous for them. The lead increases with the morning light. Class, lap times are good. Keep looking after those rear tires. Christensen is not the only one thriving. One year after the worst race of his life, Mike Rockefeller has moved into third place in the three car. And it's the number three. It's what we call the young Audi, the youth brigade here. Okay, the left time's up. Perfect, you're facing the original. Tom, are you good for another one or two? I'd like you to stay in the car. felt like I was in the car for a week. It was uh, mentally very hard, and to come out on top, this was incredibly good. And you have to think Dr. Ulrich just grins when he sees a Christensen get out and a McNish get in. Yeah. McNish, underway, perfect stop down here, and that's what you expect from this Audi team. It's kind of a milestone in the race. Or well, we call it happy hour. It's getting daylight again, you know, you kind of get your second wind. Like having a good wake up call. It's psychological because a lot of cars have already gone out by then. And you've made it through the night. And uh, good morning, John. Good morning, Mr. Truswell. Welcome to Sunday. We've got just over eight and a half hours to go, 20 past six in the morning here. So McNish on 250 laps leads for Audi. Mark Chenier in the seven car, the Peugeot is second, then Rockefeller, the three car. Tom God, these kids, eh? <laughs> Tom, Tom Christensen was doing a great job. He got himself a, a lead of uh, a whole minute. The Audis were able to cope much better with the rain than the Peugeots had been. The rain helps us a lot. Huh? The rain helps us a lot, doesn't it? Yes, it does, but it's risky. Daybreak brings a new challenge. It's raining harder now. When the driver's driving in the wet, their concentration levels have to be so high. Having to control the car physically and also mentally, you know, anticipating the next oversteer. Alan, possible heavy rain and the start. It's very strenuous for them. They're almost physically tensing up for the whole of the time. its advantage. Alan McNish stretches the lead over the number seven Peugeot to a full lap. Amazing that he's only won it once when you consider the core drivers that he's driven with and, and, and clearly the talent that Alan has. Quite right. As the rain begins to slow, tire choice becomes a concern for everyone. The question is when to switch from wet tires to intermediates. 
tyre you're going to get is a brand new standard wet, and it's been in the oven. When Capello takes over in the number two car, he stays on the wets. But the other two Audis switch to modified intermediates, grooved slicks. Go, go. Well, this is going to be a concern for the Audi camp. I think that intermediates right now is a huge risk still. The three car actually went to that groove slick quite early with Alexander and he struggled with it a little bit the first few laps. It looks like too early. Alex is really, really having difficulties. This doesn't work now, and it doesn't look very good. Then what? Dry and wet. What, what else can we do? You have to wonder whether maybe they're using this as like a guinea pig. Put Marco out there. He's a little bit out of the hunt for the overall lead. But uh, he can get good information back to the whole Audi squad for Dindo Capello's next stop. In what is likely the last Le Mans for Bila and Piro, the old champions are running fifth, where they've been almost since the start of the race. We were never able to set the car up in a way that would enable us to drive really quick lap times. So we were somehow lacking of speed. Don't ask me why, because if I knew I would have done something. They are probably sometimes a little bit slower they are probably sometimes a little bit more careful in traffic but they hardly ever put a foot wrong and then at the end as we have seen in the last two years and here they are this is not their year oh, it. It's gone. that's what we're talking about yeah you think you're going slow enough and suddenly there is zero grip and it was very, very difficult to keep the car on the road with almost slick tires for the given condition. So he spun off, and on top of that, by restarting, the clutch just broke. A significant problem for Marco Werner in the number one Audi, the defending race winner, making his way back to pit lane, and he is crawling. I was rather sad because it was the last race Frank and I would drive together. With Frank, we shared a lot of incredible moments, a lot of incredible success, and uh, you know, the last race, it would have been really nice to end up with a major result. It is declutched. They are fixing it. They're working like mad. But uh, I'm afraid that, that is going to take it right out of the reckoning. After 30 minutes in the garage, the number one car is back in the race but out of the money. Dindo, the other two Audis, but it's too early. So we have to look after that tire. In car two, Dindo's lead is more than a lap. But the gap is shrinking. The number seven Peugeot is right behind him. There's still eight and a half miles plus two car lengths between these two cars, and Dindo Capello, watching in his mirrors, doesn't have to do anything silly. Remember, at the end of the Monza race, Mike Rockefeller could have let the Peugeot go and felt he had a fight, and it cost him the race ultimately. I just don't see Dindo making that kind of mistake. This has been the perfect, perfect race, the one they needed to run till this point. Can they complete the task? The strategy was uh, really easy on the paper. Eh? No driver mistake, no pit stop mistake, no mechanic mistake, no engineer mistake. It's so easy to write all these things, but it's almost impossible to make it happen.
Callum McNish sitting quietly on the, the pit wall. He does not want to be disturbed at the moment. I can understand why after he's been robbed so many times at Le Mans by the one they call Lady Luck, Lady Bad Luck to uh, McNish. He is just keeping himself to himself. She absolutely is the nastiest thing you can imagine. Lady Luck's got nothing on the Great Dane. <laughs> An hour goes by, another perfect stint, another perfect pit stop. you could really see immediately it was written back to 2007. seconds or something with the spin. issues and we actually had to change the oil in the car and uh, that was when it got backed into the garage so lucas lore sits in the car to take over on the next stint if and when the three gets back out on track the young gun's dream of a podium finish dies in the garage they will finish in fourth place i wanted to be on the podium first time but overall, it was really important for me that we finish the race. You learn a lot in the 24 hours. So to finish fourth, I think it's not a bad result. The crowd ebbs and flows, mainly around the start and finish. To be here on the front straight is simply amazing at either end of this motor race. Tell you what, the skies are looking uh, pretty. Look at those skies there. It looks very great. It looks slicks at the moment. Boy, oh boy, if it's a big enough sudden enough downfall there on slicks, that could be very unpleasant. Oh, we got some rain coming. There is one hour left in the race, but it is far from over. One of the many worries for Dr. Ulrich is that the gap that Tom Christensen has at the front of the field is going down hand over fist as well. Two minutes, less than two minutes separating first to second. Last lap, Nick Manassian took five seconds off of TK. That's what he needs to do for the next hour and eight minutes. Then that will be very tight. Pitch strength, 
This could be a pivotal point in the race. Who makes the right choice regarding tyres? Remember the interest were very, very good in the dry. It ain't going to be dry for long. Huh? It isn't going to be dry for long. Is it going to rain heavy? We've got to come in this lap, otherwise it's too late. It's just if it's in or it's wet. Get him in for intermediate. Something anyway. We, we, we need a touch splash yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. They are hot, yeah. Hot. Box this lap, Tom. Box this lap for intermediates. The engineer wins the argument. The tires are changed. At the other end of pit lane, Peugeot makes a different decision. The seven car stays on dry slicks. They bring the enters out and then take them back. That could be the deciding moment in this motor race. Either way. Those are decisions that are going to win it or lose it. And it's the last minute ones that are the worst. I would like to know what special car number seven has done. Tom, let's not worry about them. I want you to get through this rain on the tyres that you have on your car. I think you made the right choice. Tom, 39 minutes, 39. After more than 23 hours, Peugeot is finally broken. Here, he's just overtaken. He's lapped him. Copy that, just so. Nicholas Manassian has a flat tyre, has a deflating tyre. He's just gone through Tet Rouge. Look at how he's fighting the car. Box this lap, Tom. Box this lap. Race leader is in. Here is Tom Christensen with less than 14 minutes remaining. His final stop of this race. It is the 33rd pit stop of the day. Four less than Persia for a total of nine fewer minutes. More than enough to make the difference in the race. Tom, it is now exactly four minutes left. 
them. In the last lap, we really understand you made it, uh, what we have done as a team, what we have done for this victory. Alan McNish has been waiting 10 years to get his second Le Mans victory. Look at the crowd, look at the fans. Alan McNish, Dindo Capello, boys to celebrate with their good friend and longtime teammate, Tom Christensen. It was three years ago when we made the call. Tom Christensen is the greatest ever at the mall. Well, the great man has become even better. Say, I don't think it was the f it was the speed of the car because I drove the last lap very slow. But um, for sure, you you get wet eyes and you drive over to the checkered flag and and you know that this is Le Mans. It has to be the best win for Audi. You know, we were the underdog. Yeah, yeah, it was. Eight for Audi and eight for Tom Christensen, three for Dindo Capello, and I am delighted to see it too for Alan McNish. This time, I think the three best won. Really, they deserved it big time. It didn't help my sorrow because still I wasn't there, but uh, I was really, really happy for them, I have to say. I will remember this race as a race where the people beat the machines. What we call always this Audi family, this time makes really, make the difference. Yeah, who would ever thought you'd see Wolfgang Ulrich looking as, uh, as choked up and emotional as that? The spirit in the garage amongst the three cars like no other that I've experienced was that any of us in the garage would have been happy for one of the cars to win. I've never really felt it quite as strong as it was there. It was very much the human element that won the race. Peugeot had a much faster car, but they didn't have all of that. Well done, young man. I didn't think that was going to happen. You did it, dude. For me personally, I didn't feel that kind of massive joy or happiness. Age, age. <laughs> you're a secret weapon, mate. You know that. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a fantastic victory. Your daughter can be very proud and I'm born as well. Thank you very much. You're physically exhausted. <laughs> you're mentally destroyed, you could say. <laughs> you're absolutely knackered. You know, all the guys, you know, they're all there hugging each other and yeah and great and I just, I don't know why, but that wasn't there. It was, yeah, that, the, yeah, difficult. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I really was, <laughs> you know, it's, uh... to be honest, I just wanted to go and sit somewhere on my own, you know, and just sit down and just kind of, yeah, and it, it's done. Not bad, huh? After 24 hours, the engineer finally finds a place to rest. And a pile of tires 
at one Le Mans. As a racing driver, I have to say, and I've won my fair share of races and championships, to stand on the top step of the podium at Le Mans, look down, see 60, 70,000 fans just below you. You know that you've just been through the most grueling test of man and machine, and you've won, you're there. It's a fantastic sensation. reality is victory is victory it's winning and I've finished second and third before and had non-finishes when we've been leading and everything else but when you come away from here having tasted the champagne my god it's sweet